Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Matt Scott, and we do the deep dive on the principles of overlanding expedition vehicle campers. So these are going to be the big expedition trucks that we see all over Instagram, man trucks, earth roamers, LMTVs. We're going to talk about why large vehicles like that are so popular for overlanding, how to prepare them properly, things to consider around those vehicles, and why sometimes bigger just might be better. And a special thanks to Rocky Talkies for their support of this week's podcast. Rocky Talkies are backcountry radios designed by a small team in Denver. The radios are extremely rugged, easy to use, and compact, weighing in at just under 8 ounces. They have a range of 1 to 5 miles in the mountains and up to 25 miles line of sight. The batteries will last from 3 to 5 days, and you can recharge them easily via USB-C right in the vehicle. Our team uses Rocky Talkies, and we also used them recently at the Overland Expo. The next Overland Expo, stop into our booth and say hello and check out the radios for yourself. And as a listener of the Overland Journal podcast, you can get 10% off a pair by going to rockytalkie.com forward slash Overland Journal. Thanks again, Rocky Talkie. Okay, Matt. So we're going to talk about the principles of overlanding expedition vehicles. Ooh, I'm excited for this one. This and is my specific It is. Niche. And you have been doing a lot of research on it recently. You've been spending a lot of time on the category. And you also, I believe, have a really strong argument for the benefits of it and an understanding of the downsides because you've now owned your Earth Roamer for how long? Oh, we bought it at the end of 2020. So yeah, that's so, that's a lo- that might be the guess, longest you've ever owned a car. Yeah, and I have zero interest in selling it. It is like my prized possession, so yep. to speak. It had always been a goal. My goal when I was, you know, just started working at Overland Journal 10 years, well, it was more than 10 years ago, so it was 2011. I wanted an Earth Roamer with a KTM rally bike on the back. <laughs> I've got an Earth Roamer with a factory KTM rally bike on the back. How did your life change when you arrived at that goal? Like what? It's something that you've wanted forever. I mean, obviously it was a lot of work and a lot of stress. I yeah. think I think that, you know, to put it in a way that maybe society would understand is it's, it's my boat. It's my boat that I go do my little projects on and I clean and it's my own little ecosystem and world that I have complete control over. Yeah. You know, so in in the way that, you know, an entrepreneur or executive or or something might have that boat that's their escape, the Earth Roamer is my land boat. And, you know, it's actually funny because there's a lot of systems that come from the marine world that are uh, uh, super applicable with expedition vehicles. Um, But, you know, we just found out that we started getting out more and we changed how we traveled. We had for a long time, really focused on very remote places that other people couldn't get to. And that was, you know, best evidenced by the vehicles that we were we were building. Uh, look at the Gladiator that we had. If people don't know what it was, it was basically an AEV Gladiator with adventure trailers or AT Overland Summit camper on the back. And that was awesome because we were able to get really, really remote. As remote as you wanted to. Yeah. yeah I mean, if it... If you could get something, I don't think that there would be many vehicles more capable than that, that you could still kind of sleep inside of. But we started to kind of hit our limits with that. You know, we obviously were, we're doting a uh, Greyhound parents and Laura and I are not small people. I'm six two. She's, you know, just under six foot. Our dog is 80 pounds and yeah, uh, uh, big. And that was a lot to ask from that small of a space to to try and have some kind of temperature regulation or whatever. So, you know, we always knew that we wanted some kind of expedition vehicle. And the Earth Roamer for us just made so much sense because we knew from the Summit Camper that we wanted something that was hard sided. And how it, you know, to go back to how it changed our, our travels is that we were less interested in the very remote technical trails because we actually ended up finding that those had become very well used. There was a lot of, and you've done a lot of them and we've done them and I've done them two, three, four, five times. Sure. So it kind of lost its appeal. You know, eventually it just kind of felt repetitive. So we kind of shifted. Well, actually, you know, the, the big thing that we noticed was that by going for maybe like easier Spots, because obviously uh, an earth roamer or an expedition vehicle does not have the same technical terrain capability as a light truck, although they're pretty good. 
you know, we started doing a lot more national forests and we started slowing down a little bit more. And we, you have to slow down. Yeah. Yeah. You have to. And it became more about the experience of camping. And if you were in a place that didn't have an amazing view, you didn't have to do the rocky trail that went to the promontory point with the amazing lookout. Yeah. One, we realized that that's what everybody else was doing with this whole explosion in overlanding. And we're, we're spending a lot more time in national forests and national parks. You know, sometimes we use it just like it was an RV. And I think that's really where, where I see the expedition vehicle space growing as it is this amalgamation of overlanding uh, as maybe it's perceived in the U.S., the forerunner with the roof tent or the truck camper or, or, or something. Sure mixed with a, a bit of the RV world because you kind of have to have solutions and, and, and problems from both. We love it. Like we just absolutely love it. Um, yeah. And you get out in it a lot. You yeah. use it a lot. In fact, there's been many times I've come over to your house and we hung out in the earth roamer in your garage. It's, one, it's like a cool little spot. One, it's amazing to have a garage that your earth roamer fits inside of. Uh, two, it, it serves this multi-purpose of it's my, you know, everybody wants yeah, to you have reti- You retired, it. you're like a retired person at 30. Like you bought the retired person's house that has like the room for the class A <laughs> motor home and it's perfect. I it's love like, it. It all works. I love living in Prescott. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, to touch on that by basing ourselves in Prescott, it allowed us to do this. You yeah. Know, we were, if, if our business was based in Southern California, like, like so many, uh, you know, businesses are, our house would be four times the cost. For That's sure. where the money for the earth roamer came from. You know, we really look at the earth roamer as our cabin. Yeah. You know, we go out with family in it. We go out with friends in it. You get to go to Greyhound events in it. Yeah. It's awesome. Like, <laughs> you, you know, do. You, get, you get to be the star of the show. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, and it's also really nice for traveling with, with dogs. Ours is, uh, you know, four door LTS. So it's LTS just means uh, stretch, stretch yeah. it, it, essentially. So again, we're, we're able to go out with our friends that have toy haulers or travel trailers. And we're as, as much a part of that group as we are able to go out with friends in roof tents or truck campers. Sure. You know, we can kind of go either way with it. And we did that recently within the last couple of months, we did that trip to Alamo Lake. Yeah. And I was towing a Patriot camper behind a Raptor R and, and we took a backcountry route to get there and you went every single place that we went. It was fun. And that was my experience with maybe let's back up for a minute. And I think it would be good for the audience for us to define what we mean by an expedition vehicle, which a lot of times that term is interchangeable with expedition camper. Maybe you can kind of share what you believe is like what defines an expedition vehicle as opposed to, to an it, overland to truck. To put it bluntly, it's, an, it's, a, it's more, you could think of it as an RV that is, you know, capable of extended off-road travel. Yeah. You know, a Class C motorhome might be able to go down the dirt road a little bit in quartzite to find, you know, the campsite. It's not something that you're going to want to do with that vehicle because long-term uh, it will compromise the vehicle, yeah. right? So there's- a- And all the systems that you have on exactly. expedition campers- are much more robust and bigger capacity batteries, more water on yeah, board. Yeah. So there's essentially, you know, there's self-contained vehicles that uh, I think one of the, the, the biggest qualifications is live inside. They don't have to be hard sided, you know, earth cruisers, uh, some of the Ross monster stuff, which is awesome. And are definitely expedition vehicles are pop tops. Yep. You know, they often have a bathroom, a shower, uh, some cooking facilities yep. inside the nimble vehicles or pop top yep. nimble vehicles or pop tops. Yes. You know, so, so it is this, as I said earlier, kind of this amalgamation of, I mean, it's basically just an off-road RV when, when you really, really get down to it, that's the best way to describe it. Yeah. Off-road I, recreational I believe, vehicle. Makes I believe sense. there's also an element I mean, I guess, you know, you go from boats to yachts and part of that jump is the quality, yep. the, you know, the quality, the components, the longevity of it. You definitely, I think that that's part of an expedition vehicle. Yeah. Um, And it's not a yacht unless it's got a bathroom and a galley. And it's the same thing with these vehicles. Once you go to kind of an expedition camper, expedition vehicle, it's going to have a fully integrated kitchen. It's going to have a fully integrated bathroom. So like an expedition camper for me is like the AT Overland Aterra. Sure. It's not that it doesn't fulfill the same role as an expedition vehicle, but you know, like they have a, some bathroom facilities, but I think they use like a, a wrap on style. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, one of those toilets and you know, there'll be a shower, but maybe there's not a shower room. 
you know, and it's not to disparage it. It's just that, you know, there's a difference between the two, uh, both in functionality, but I, I guess at the end of the day, also in cost. And, you know, it is different than a truck camper, a truck camper on the back of an AEV, whatever, like that's a great solution, but it's not really an expedition vehicle. Like I think we're talking another uh, defining characteristic of an expedition vehicle is something that it's an integrated system. You know, I always call them integrated vehicles. That yeah, it's not a removable the, camper. Really, That was always the, the expedition portal forum heading was integrated overland yeah. vehicles or integrated expedition vehicles or something. They're kind of all in one now that does have its downsides that you know eventually i'll have enough miles on the chassis that um you know i can't take my the camper which is really then the value and put it on another truck that's the argument for like the atera sure for example it can be removed and now you got a flatbed pickup that you can use for other things yeah, yeah for yeah. sure you know the thing that uh, i do recognize with a lot of these vehicles is um particularly when you get to like the unicats and you know, some of the action mobiles and the bliss mobiles, you know, they're on truck chassis. Those things are measured in a lifespan often in the millions. Yeah. Even with the F550, that is the basis of, of my vehicle, you know, well-maintained, that is a half a million mile truck if you want it. You know, sure. I like it because it's a, at the end of the day, it's a Ford truck. You, you know, can go into any Ford dealership here in the U.S. Yeah. I mean, you know, serviced. I, I had a, an interesting experience. The Earth Roamer uses engine coolant to heat the hot water tank that's in the back of the vehicle. And there's coolant lines that run down the frame. Two hours after buying mine, not really being familiar with the truck, one of those burst happened going through the Eisenhower tunnel. So it just cooked the motor. Vehicle made it home after we realized what was going on at the bottom of the hill. You know, there was no alarms that went off. The coolant didn't even overheat uh, because it was at night and 20 degrees or whatever. But I was able to take it to the Ford dealer in Prescott. They put a new motor in it. Yes, it was expensive. Uh, did a lot of upgrades, and it was about ten percent of what I what I paid for the vehicle. But it was able to be done. Yeah, you know. So you can kind of look at these things as if you're servicing them properly. Who knows really what the lifespan of the machine is? You're not daily driving it as well. You know, with an exhibition camper, maybe you're using it as your daily driving pickup. Well, then you're putting you know, wear and tear on all this expensive stuff. And it accelerates the wear of the thing, which necessitates the fact that it has to get swapped out. Obviously there's different budgets and different realities. That's I like you know. that definition though, is it's an off-road RV yeah. that is fully integrated with the chassis and it's designed for prolonged remote travel. Yeah. Like I can do, you know, El Camino del Diablo every day of the week. Absolutely. In an expedition vehicle. Could you take a rental class C motor home down it. I mean, maybe I've done that road. Like, There's not for very far. You're not going to, you're not going to want to own that thing at the end. Of yeah. It, right? And it actually is. It's a fairly challenging trail, but one of the, not the very last time that I did it, but the time before Mike McMod was with us yeah. and Dave Nordstrom was with us and some other folks that had earth roamers and some of them had uh, sprinter vans and other different vehicles, but we got the earth roamers through all of it. Yeah. No problem. And actually, even before I started the magazine, I worked with Earth Roamer and I led a lot of their trips. Yeah. And I did a dozen adventures, including down Baja and everything else with Earth Roamers. And I was consistently shocked at where they could go. The limitation really with these expedition vehicles is the height. When you get into forested areas, you really got to make sure you're on major forest roads. So you're going to be looking at a road that's like, two digits as opposed to four digits. Like if you see FR72, you're probably golden in your expedition yeah. vehicle. If you're going down FR3679 or whatever, B, you know, the more numbers that you got. To I didn't go. actually know that. Yeah. So that's a really. You learn something every a, day. It's a, a quick tip. So in, the, in that regard, we do a lot of, you know, three digit for service roads. Yeah. I, I like to think that with one of these vehicles, you are. You, you can go pretty fast, particularly with the Roamer. It's got a four link in the back, uh, air suspension all the way around with King shocks. It's pretty capable. Your pots and pans are still rattling. Yeah. You know, your everything. Because it's got a pass through. You can hear every, everything, everything rattling. Everything that you are carrying with, you have to also put that in mind. Like, you know, I always say like you see these vans that have all these desert racing lights on the, on the top. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. But your thing can go 25 mile an hour off road, lest you get hit in the back of the head by a pan. That's right. Like, exactly. you know, like there's, there are inherent limits of 
taking a, 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 a small house down a four wheel drive trail. You know, I mean, I think Bill Swales, who founded Earth Roamer, you know, and unfortunately passed a little bit ago, said that he had to design a house that was capable of withstanding constant earthquakes. Yeah. So all of your systems have to be very robust. Sure. I have the bias towards the earth roamer because it's what I know, but there's a lot of options out there. Well, and it might be good. It might be good to kind of talk through, first of all, before we go into the, the individual models is you brought up a good point earlier before we started talking of serialized expedition vehicles and customized expedition yes. vehicles. And I think that that is a really important foundational discussion point is, so an example of a serialized expedition vehicle is the Earth Roamer. Yes. It is the Earth Cruiser. It is a an adventure truck from GXV. Yes. It would be like some of the more recent adrenaline campers. There, and there's more. Uh, mm-hmm. We're not trying to exclude anybody with it. We could spend the entire yeah. and there's po- pluses, podcast talking there's about pluses different and brands, minuses but. to both. By having a consistent layout that maybe has a few available changes for dinette versus couch, yep. couch versus whatever. You got to think about the wiring harness that goes into these. Like I think a lot they can of the, standardize them. Yeah, I think a lot of the problems that I see with some of these expedition vehicles. Uh, when they're custom or they're a new a new business, it's like kind of looking up the skirt as looking at the electrical systems. I can I can display the electrical system in the Earth Roamer to a electrical engineer, and they're like, "Wow, that's yeah. really nice." Yeah. Um, I won't name names, but you know, there's some out there that I've seen where I'm like, "Wow, like you've got like 12 positive wires crossed over each other, and all that stuff rattles and moves and yep. wears." And I'm like, "What?" When you're asking for all of these these custom modifications and you want the the camper with the the rooftop party deck and the 12 other yeah. weird custom things that you want that all comes as a compromise and it can't be engineered as a system it, you know it's like comparing a hot rod to a GT500 that comes off the line for Ford sure one is engineered and consistent and has components and if there's a failure they can then fix that on the sure. line uh, and and make those changes where, you know, with hot rods, you have the guy down the street that builds hot rods and you have Delmo Speed that builds hot rods that is really, really good and it's a, and it's a craft. So that's the thing that you have get a to, big range. You have to really understand that there's differences there. Are there things that I would like differently in, in my layout? For sure. But I also know that I can call somebody and say, I have ER 107. What is the heater in my truck? And there's actually like, OK, cool. We'll send you the parts for that. Or you have something that stops working and you get Earth Roamer on the phone and you tell him you have ER 107 and he's going to say, okay, you're going to open up the bathroom cabinet. There's going to be four screws. They're going to hold this panel in place. You're going to take those four screws out. Okay. You're going to see the yellow and the green, and the blue wire. Okay. You, you're going to cut j- the blue j- wire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> cut the blue. Yeah. But there's a huge advantage to that because yeah. it, it, because it is serialized and it's the same thing with earth cruisers. When I borrowed an earth cruiser, I had a minor issue and I was able to call them up and they're like, no problem. They knew exactly where the, the relay was. They knew exactly where the switch was. They, and they were able to provide us with immediate support. The upside of the custom stuff is you get exactly what you think you want. But I want to talk about that for a second, because I think the problem is, is that people who buy custom expedition vehicles, they have never owned one before. In most cases, they have rarely had like a sphere of experience. So they had it kind of have it in their mind that, okay, we want that. We want this alley or this galley style, and we want this giant bathroom and we want this, and we want that and everything else. And then they end up with this very unlivable space because it's got so much stuff packed into it. And it comes because they lack that experience or they want to integrate all of this fancy new technology that hasn't been proven yet. And they're going to say, yes, this custom expedition vehicle company is going to be like, yep, it's like 1.2 million bucks. Here's your camper. The reality is, is that the closer you can get to just like in, think of a Land Cruiser, Mm -hmm. they make millions of them and they make them very well. The closer that you can get to serialized production, the more reliable it will be, the better serviceability you'll have, the better chance you'll be able to get it fixed in the field. If you've got to fly in a technician from Earth Roamer or from from Earth Cruiser, they're going to know what to bring. They're going to know how to fix it. And your downtime is going to be limited. Whereas the number of catastrophic failures that I've seen with custom 
expedition vehicles, yeah. like frames and these bodies breaking body mounts. And so you're, you're doing, you're doing, I mean, even at a everything's a one-off level, everything's a one-off. There's no repetition. Yep. It's, it's silly to not, you know, like Lance that, that owns and runs earth cruiser in the U S he is a smart guy, but also one of the most well-traveled people I've, I've met I in mean, the industry. He, yeah, for sure. He puts, he puts his earth cruiser on a boat and he's gone for, yeah. I mean, he's just, he's gone for a while, but it's that experience that then gets integrated into the vehicles That's right. that makes them so good. Like I want to make sure I give earth cruiser some love because while I love, love, love my earth rummer, if I was to undertake serious travel, like I was gonna, I don't know when I'm coming back and I'm going to drive around the world. I would do it in an earth cruiser. Yeah. Put it in a container. Yeah. They, they fit in containers. Even if you don't you get the FX that I don't know if those can, I think you can put different wheels on them. Mm-hmm. The FX has a, a solid sides, which I think is really cool. And if not, you they're roll, just the row, right, row it. Yeah. yeah. They're the right size. Yeah. They're a little less intimidating in the vehicle. Like when you see an earth roamer, like I have to, you know, figure an extra 10 minutes to get gas yeah. if I'm, if I'm in a rush. Cause it's, all of these people that come over and so the first question is how much that thing costs? And I'm like, Oh, I don't want to answer it. I don't want to answer it <laughs> yeah. with the earth cruisers. They're a little bit more low key. They fit in a regular parking spot. They do. The earth roamers can fit in a parking spot if you have a, a room to back up. Um, and they're pretty maneuverable with the high steer axle that the wide track axle or whatever it's called, but the earth cruisers are this fantastic you know, well proven. And they don't look, even size. though they are not inexpensive, they do not look. Like they look like a kind of a bread delivery van, yeah. which well, you either love or hate. But I think it's an advantage while you're traveling. Yes. I think it's an advantage to be in this white, nondescript, looks like a delivery vehicle. And in fact, in most countries, a Fuso is, is a, the, the, the delivery vehicle. So if you think about the roads, the parking spaces, the turns, like they've got to move goods and services around all these small towns. And that's what they use is vehicles that size. Yeah. You know, there's all these different, you know, layers of the onion. And and the fact that it's cab over. So you end up. Which you either like or you don't like, I have to say. like, Well, the ride quality goes down, but the maneuverability goes way up. Yes. So there's like everything gets a compromise. Yeah. Yeah. Like personally, I'm not a, a big cab over guy. You know, so the LMTVs, the man trucks, like things like Yumogs. that. I, I just like driving a pickup truck. Sure. Like it's, 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 it's very, what you drive every day. It's very natural sure. to me. My expedition vehicle is no wider than a dually. In fact, it's actually narrower than a modern dually. So probably marginally. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not that much, but it is a couple just inches on either like side. Eight point eight foot, six inches wide. Is that how wide your earth roamer is? Yeah. They're I pretty just, wide. I just know that uh, how much from the cab how much it sticks out. Yeah. And I know that a, you know, a dually sticks out more. Yeah, um, sure. Cause it has the single rear wheel conversion. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that, that go into it. And then, you know, I think one of the things we need to talk about for, for the essentials is the consequences of taking a very heavy vehicle, very remote with a lot of systems become a lot higher. Mm-hmm. You know, I would never, for example, carry a starter in my old gladiator in my Jeep, because if it broke down, my buddy can throw a strap on the front and we can tow it somewhere to where a tow truck can get it to or whatever. The thing that we learned really quickly when we had this, this major problem with our truck uh, right after getting it was, Oh crap. Like if this thing breaks down on the side of the road, it it requires like, like the same, you know, wrecker to come get you. That would get a semi truck. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're on the highway, those things are all over. If you're down for a forest road with, four letters on it. (laughs) You, if it's something that you're not capable of fixing, you are bringing somebody in. So we, for example, every electronic sensor that's on the engine that could create a, a no start or no run condition. We carry those. It was just an, it was like 800 bucks in sensors. But if I don't have them and I need them, what is that going to cost? Sure. We carry a starter you know, we carry, I continue to run the, the DPF system on mine. You know, I, I always say like, if I have the, the luxury of, of owning an earth roamer, I can afford to fix and service the DPF because I like enjoying nature and yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. We never want to pollute unnecessarily. And it's also illegal to take that off, but some, some people will. We well, just, if you're traveling internationally, you could take it off. We, we've decided we carry the, I think it's like the temperature sensors or something that are known to fail while well, they were like 20 bucks. 
I have like five of them, you know, carrying with you some of those components generally related to the chassis. Like if you run out of heat or your AC stops working or something, that's not catastrophic. So you have to plan for those, I'm going to call them catastrophic events. Like obviously if the engine goes, goes poof, there's really nothing that you can do with that. But with most modern vehicles, the core of them are pretty reliable. Like they've made millions of Ford six, seven engines. Sure. We know exactly what the problems are and what the, and you bulletproofed yours as I remember did a version of that. Uh, I, I have some parts from bulletproof on there. So like I did the bulletproof EGR, it's not really needed on the six, seven, to be honest, that was more of like a six Oh thing hmm. where as these emission control systems were starting uh, to come onto the market, there was, there was growing pains for sure. The six, seven doesn't have many. Mm. Um, you know, that motor is still in production, but there were things that, that we did for reliability. We did different exhaust manifolds because everything was out. We did a different turbo, not a necessarily a performance turbo, although it does flow slightly more when my motor went poof, the you, poof took out the it's turbo. Oil, it's oil cooled. So you don't then know what gets into that turbo. Sure. So you have to replace it. Um, like the Ford turbos for the early six sevens are known to have some issues. Ford's pretty good at revising parts. The basics here that I'm, that I'm really trying to get at is develop a relationship with a mechanic that knows the chassis uh, that you have and figure out what is breaking. Because if you have an LMTV or you have some the man truck that you are not going to get parts for, you know, at the Ford dealer down the street, it's probably smart to carry some of that stuff with. Now, I'm not saying carry a, a spare transmission because the transmission might go. You know, those are those are those big things that if they happen, you're just going to have to deal it's with it. It's just the risk of driving it. Yeah. Sure. And, and that kind of translates into, you know, if you have the parts, you have to, you know, you have to have some skill to be able to replace them. It doesn't mean that you have to do it quick. It just means that you have to get the job done so you can get out. Sure. So toolkits are going to be different for an expedition vehicle versus a Jeep. You know, you have large suspension components. Like I carry a socket for the four link that is a a Kelderman system on my vehicle. Well, I carry the correct sockets and wrenches to be able to service that. Not that I'm expecting necessarily that a bushing is going to fail or this or that. Because again, those are things that you drive slowly to a point that you can get further help because you're not jacking this thing up and doing, doing that in the middle of nowhere a bolt might come loose that you need to tighten and you can fix that before it becomes a problem. So you have to consider both for the, the coach, you know, the camper portion, the live in portion, and then the vehicle, what tools you're going to need to service on modern vehicles. You know, there's, you know, OBD scanners, like I carry, I think it's like OBD link two, and I have this app called four scan and it allows me to have some a terrible name. I know <laughs> it allows me to have some basic functionality that, uh, you know, the Ford diagnostics would have more than an OBD two reader, less than the computer that, sure. that Ford has, you know, things like forcing a region of the diesel particulate filter. Oh, sure. I want to be able to do that. So you can regen it when you want to, not when you're climbing some big hill or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And there's some tuners that give you that functionality. Like I have a Banks gauge in mine and I, I think that's the best thing that, that I could recommend to any of these trucks because they're, they're going to be running towards the, the higher end of their gross vehicle weight rating. Yeah. Your earth roamer weighs 19,000 pounds. Yeah. I mean, it, it depends on what is in there. Mine has 117 gallons of fresh water. Yeah. That's that's a lot, you know, that's half a ton of water. But you also did a good job recently of you had this extra storage box on the back and a bunch of extra things and you pulled all that off. I pulled all that off. You had to have saved hundreds of pounds. Hundreds of pounds. And I also went through and kind of optimized that spares package. For me, after having the, 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 the traumatic event with the engine right after getting it, I carried a lot of things that I didn't need. Pair some of that back based on experience. Like if I and also, I kind of make my make things modular now. Like I found that these Pelican fifteen fifty cases, yes, they're a little bit heavier, but they they fit in the space really well. Perfect. So I have one that is like you know that I'm building that is my big trip kit. Like 
if I'm driving to the Arctic Ocean again, there's things that I would take with me that would be different than... Or maybe you're going down to Baja or whatever. Yeah, or Baja or, yeah. Or, or a place where, you know, serviceability is going to be more of a challenge. You know, don't be afraid to to kind of segment your kit. Sure. You know, I always carry a belt because that's a no start condition. On my truck, I carry a, I do carry a fuel pump. Not that they're necessarily known for going out, but if they do, the truck's dead in the water. Yeah. And I have decided to allocate the space for that. Sure. To kind of wrap it up, carry the tools that you need to service your your, your vehicle. Likely the, the bolt, the size of the bolt that holds your control arm on for a Jeep mm-hmm. and the one that is on a medium or heavy duty truck chassis, they're going to be different sizes. Try and work with that kit when you're at home. So you have that process of elimination. And a special thanks to Onyx Off-Road for helping to support this week's podcast. Going further on your adventures is about having the right tools. The Onyx Off-Road app's intuitive maps make it easy to find trails and disperse camping. And their offline maps give you full GPS navigation capability without cell coverage. I'm also really excited about their new route builder for planning and sharing custom trips. It's got a snap to trail tool where you can just drop points where you want to go and a route automatically connects to the closest road or trail. You can build, save, and add routes to folders and share your entire trip with your buddies. You can find out more information on onxmaps.com. You can also find their apps in the Apple Store or whatever other device that you use. Thanks again, Onyx. I remember there was early on in Earthrumor, they had a, a client, I won't name names, but he was a very wealthy Australian that drove an Earthrumor around the world. He was in Mongolia when there was a problem with the Ford, either the engine or the turbo mm-hmm. or something like that. And the only way around it, because there was no way to move the vehicle safely from where it was at. So he had to just coordinate getting a Ford technician all the parts, flying yeah. them into Mongolia, probably getting in a Land Cruiser, <laughs> driving to the vehicle and doing this re- major repair to the Ford in the middle of Mongolia. So that would not have been cheap. But you do have to consider that if you are going to be taking one of these vehicles to very remote places, that that is a possibility. Yep. You know, that's why going with let's maybe transition from from this to there's a lot of DIY guys. Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, let's use the, as an example, there's, I mean, there's so many chassis, there's the LMTV, there's these man chassis. I mean, there's, there's a lot out there and you primarily see this with European travelers because there's, for whatever reason, there's just a lot of very applicable vehicles there. And there's a much larger expedition vehicle scene. Yeah. Go to Aventura and Allred. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, exactly. So look at a Unicat in person. It's just awe-inspiring. You know, so let's just talk about the guy that buys the ex-military Unimog and, you know, builds their own camper. I, I think that stuff's great. Like, those are the people that I, I totally really agree. see traveling. Yeah, um, there's a lot of that out there. You know, there's a lot of guys that really do use their Earth Roamers and their Earth Cruisers and, you know, and other, and other vehicles. I feel bad to keep, you know, defaulting to Earth Roamer and Earth Cruiser, but they're just in the U.S. They are the the lion's share. They just have They've big, been around big volume. Longer, yeah, and they have the big volumes. Yeah. The the DIY guys, they're, you know, they'll get their box from Total Composites or box manufacturer. And they really know these vehicles mm-hmm. because they've built them. And there's a huge advantage to knowing the systems. The downsides is maybe the guy that's installing the heater or the, the, the electrical system or whatever is doing the best that he can, but maybe isn't a professional sure. uh, electrical engineer or, or something, right? So. If you're listening to this and it's like, oh, an Earth Roamer or Earth Cruiser or GXV, Adrenaline, all of these things are not in the financial budget, which is just a reality. There are a lot of options for building your own, like quite affordably. Like you can, you know, affordability is relative to this space. It is inherently expensive. Like there's no way of getting around the fact that you're going to have to buy very expensive lithium batteries and all of these components. But you can, you can find a Mitsubishi Fuso FG, let's call it 10 years old, which will be pre-def, pre all that stuff. You can find those in the $30,000 range here in the United States. And then you basically, you build, there's like total composites out of out of Canada yeah. that builds boxes, very affordable. Yep. 
They're unfinished on the inside. So now you've got a proven global platform for 30,000 bucks. The box is going to cost you less than that unfinished, yep. but it's ready to be bolted on to the chassis rails. You take the time to do it all yourself yep. so that you know where every wire is. You know, you know, watch YouTube, learn how to set these things up and go with well-proven components, put less stuff in the truck than you think you need. And the next thing you know, you're off, you're off doing it yourself. Yeah. It's, it's very important for me to stress that this is not just a club for guys that are dropping half a million or a million dollars on, on these vehicles. I think the heart and soul of the expedition community are the DIY guys. Yeah. I mean, like, frankly, that is who I see traveling internationally using these vehicles as intended the most bar none. An earth roamer leaving the U S happens, but generally, generally it is the exception. There are just so many, you know, honestly, people my age in Europe, that are building their mogs or or whatever, or they buy a chassis, yeah. modify the chassis. And this is like where Bliss Mobile comes in. And I think that Bliss Mobile is really cool. Is you buy this box. Uh, some really dear friends of ours, Cullen and Candy, actually bought a Bliss Mobile box and they bought a truck through Bliss Mobile. They live in Arizona. They keep it in Europe. And they do all these, one, they do all these cool Bliss Mobile trips with other owners and there's good camaraderie. But they will be able to, you know, sell that truck off, keep their box, ship it to Bliss Mobile in the United States, yep. have Spencer Park, put it on a Ram or put it on one of the, you know, an Acela truck or something. And their big asset is all pretty much self-contained. Yeah, right. It still is, has their, their pots and pans. It and, still has and, their pots. And, <laughs> exactly. It's got their own stuff in there. They just move the box and then you don't have to there's no temporary import. There's no carne. Yeah. You're just bringing the box it's your in. Asset. There's no, there's yeah. no emissions regulation. Nothing. That stuff. Now the thing you have to, you do have to notice that there's different voltages. So with these campers, with these expedition vehicles, much like an RV, you have shore power. So you have a 110 based system, like either a 30 or 50 amp. Most of these are 30 amps. And then you're going to, you know, higher voltage, 220, 220 yeah, 240. Sure. Um, so one of the things that I'm currently researching, like I would love to ship ours to Iceland and then, uh, put it on a ferry and then do the Scandinavian Nordic countries. How do I charge it now? Yeah. If you're moving every day, that's not really, I think there's issue. actually converters. There, I think. there are, but there's not a lot of information yeah. on that. So if anybody's actually figured out a solution for that, that's actually reliable and isn't, yeah, isn't uh, gigantic, gigantic. Yeah. Um, you know, that's an interesting thing, but you know, there are these options. It's actually really cool that bliss mobiles in the U S now, because Super they're, cool. they're very reputable. They actually, and I want to give a shout out to them. They have a, I want to say it's an eight or a 10 foot box that can go They're They're partnering with AEV to build trucks for this small, this new small box size. I mean, if that, imagine was, that, if that was out when I, when we bought our earth roamer, it would be really hard to not have a brand new because basically the newer chassis you can get, the more reliable personally, I believe that they've become the faster they are, the better the braking. They're just nicer inside too. a new vehicle. I mean, I think a lot of people misunderstand that if you, if you have a 30 year old 80 series land cruiser, which when it was new was one of the most reliable vehicles ever made. Yeah. But a 30 year old, 80 series Land Cruiser is no more reliable or less reliable than a new Land Rover. I yeah. mean, it's just the reality having a new car with new belts, new, like all the new systems, yeah. it's going to be more reliable There's things that time than an out. old car. There's a lot of things that, you know, and this is maybe again, going back to the guys that are looking at doing this from a DIY level is, you know, if you find the Unimog, the LMTV, whatever chassis you're choosing, a lot of times these are ex-military and yep. there's this idea, oh yeah, well, they're they're well-maintained. Sometimes, yes. And sometimes you can find them with shockingly low miles or kilometers on them, but the oil seals don't care. There's a lot of components that will Anything time rubber. Out. Anything rubber. Yep. It's, it's time related, not necessarily mileage related. For sure. So not saying that it's not a good idea. You can get a lot of bang for your buck, but you have to, you then have to prepare for having the rear main seal for, uh, you know, an obscure Unimog engine that in the United States we don't get. Yep. That's why I, I keep coming back to that Mitsubishi Fuso FG. Yeah. Like 10 year old. Yeah. It's going to be pre-def. They put no million, particulate filter. They put a million miles on those. All those, day long. All day long. They're pretty good. Yeah. Uh, recovery also changes from 
the kind of recreational four wheel drive side to the expedition vehicle side. I've got a lot of max tracks because that's my gig, but I carry eight because one of the things that I'm most worried about, I think if I'm going to get stuck in an expedition vehicle, I'm probably aware that there's a risk. Sure. But the things that you don't think of are it rains overnight, you're in a yep. field and that much weight, like the roads give way. You know, there was the Unimog, which I think was a GXV and Big Bend that, you know, had to have a helicopter come and bring it up. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not going to comment on driver error or anything there, but the fact is the road gave way. Yeah. Uh, there was recently an earth roamer uh, that was a big recovery thing that was on Instagram. Road gave way. Yeah. You have to, you know, not only in the recovery scenario, but how you drive them, you have to give yourself more room. You don't want to put your you know, your tire on wet soil on a shelf road yep. at the very end. You should have the training to get yourself out of some of these situations. That's right. You know, a lot of these vehicles will have front and rear winches. They're only as good as your training. Most likely, like I have, I'm not saying it's the largest winch that Warren offers, but I have a Warren 16.5 on the front of my vehicle. The chassis is rated for 19.5. Generally, you want 50% more, but it's just not really available. So I have to- Lots of pulley blocks. Pulley blocks and knowing how to do those things. Um, that's where I really like the Max Track stuff because it, if you're on unstable ground, you have something that you can winch up onto sure. to at least stabilize the situation. Because if the road gave way once, there's a strong likelihood that it could give way more sure. and move. You know, So building a kit that is- appropriately sized to the weight of the vehicle and that may that means that the great recovery gear that you've invested in for your jeep it's not going to work over here it's not and, and you may want to have a, another expedition vehicle with you you may want to travel with a buddy which is why i, if I do you're doing see technical stuff yeah if, that's why we, anytime we really pushed it with the earth roamers we made sure we had a couple of them along because you know it doesn't matter how capable a uh, Wrangler is, it weighs one third. What yeah, an Earth like you're does. just like, you it's know, it's not going to pull it out. It's, it's, you know, you're just going to be, uh, yeah. you know, trying to get an elephant to move on a leash. Like yeah. it's, 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 it's just not going to work. It's not going. Definitely recovery comes to mind and being very cautious. I like the idea of someone putting an e-bike on the back of their Earth Roamer or Earth Cruiser, take your pick. Having something like that that becomes your scout vehicle. I have used drones a lot with expedition vehicles mm. where I'm. We just got one, yeah. Where I'm flying ahead and I'm looking at the terrain. Is this going to put me along a shelf road? Particularly on shelf roads, I like to go up, uh, ahead and make sure that, okay, I could, this is the, the next place I can turn around. I come back, I drive to that place and I stop again. Yeah. And I confirm because, and also it gives the chance to run into people coming the other direction and just be like, is there any way you could stop here for about 15 minutes until I make it to this clearing so you can come around me? Because if you run into, if you're the one that's coming downhill, you should be giving way to whoever's coming back, who's going uphill. And are you going to back an Earth Roamer or an Earth Cruiser yeah. or a GXV up a shelf road? That's exactly. very, very yeah. challenging. So I think having a, having a little e-bike or having a small dirt bike. Yeah, or bicycle or whatever. Yeah, bicycle, whatever turns you on. And, yep. and to build on that, recognizing that the consequences are different in the same way that you maybe need to carry some uh, additional uh, spares that you wouldn't in a Jeep. Your mindset cannot be the same as if you were in a Jeep. You have yep. to adjust your risk level because the consequences become much higher, much much quicker. Yeah. Simple situation. Like you're, you're saying shelf road, somebody's coming down the hill, you know, you can't just kind of pull up on the bank and let them buy. It's, no. you know, the, some of these vehicles aren't maybe as wide as people think, you know, like I know on, on my Roamer, the mirrors are still the same width as a Ford pickup truck. Sure. And they still stick out further. Sure. You know, there's a, there is some mental game there. You have to consider those things. But again, like you said, you get, you have to give them some room. So you're now you're getting right up to the edge of the shelf road, which yeah. could give way because of the weight of the vehicle. A thousand Jeeps came through there before that then, and the road never gave way because yeah. they didn't weigh 18,000 pounds. I do think it requires a mindset change to say, I have my house with me. Why am I in a rush if I've got my house with me? Yep. I'm going to take my time. I'm going to stage here. I'm going to verify that the route ahead is safe. I'm going to use multiple communication devices and navigation tools to make good choices. Anytime I've ever gotten in trouble with an expedition vehicle, it has always been because I'm like, oh, it'll be fine. The one platform that I found to be surprisingly nimble and, and really not an issue was a Unicat on a Unimog. Mm, so yeah, it was like, a, like the 416, isn't that right? 
Like it's it's the it's kind of the it's not the really old Unimog. It's not the brand the, the new boxy, Unimog. Yeah, very boxy. One. Yeah, yeah, like late eighties, early nineties Unimog, and it had a fairly small Unicat camper on the back of it, and we were driving it around Southern Africa. And the stuff that we did with that was, I mean, it was a challenge for the Land Cruisers that were with us. This vehicle had no trouble. Yeah, Lock all the diffs, 200 to one low range. It was incredible. And they're stable portal axles. Like it's, it's, you know, it's just bigger. But I think it was short wheelbase. It was fairly compact. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the things to recognize is, do you have an expectation of doing the same trails that you have historically done in a pickup or a Jeep or whatever? Like, is that, are you trying to accomplish the same level of capability, but with more comfort that needs to dictate what vehicles yeah, you're, for sure. you're purchasing? Yeah, for sure. But most people, when they buy these, it's an RV that is capable of extended dirt road travel. Yeah. You need the larger tires, not only to look cool, but because you need the load carrying capacity of that tire on Earth Roamers and Earth Roamers actually run a Unimog tire. It's the Continental MPT-81. They are the best thing on that truck, but also the worst thing. They're rated to 68 mile an hour. If you, uh, the truck will do a lot more than 68, but there's a lot of guys that they're on a stretch of pavement. They're not paying attention. All of a sudden they're doing 80. It's hundred degrees out in Texas yep. and the tires shred. They blow I mean, that out. Is what Catastrophic. Happens. And they're like, fit. oh, I can't believe this. I'm like, oh, well, I can. Because yeah. you're you're at the you're at the the extreme of what that tire can carry in terms of pressure, and then you're exceeding the speed, and it's yeah. hot, and all these sixty eight miles an hour. You're right. That's that is, that is as fast as you can drive like, an Earth Roamer on MPTs. That's it. Yeah, I, I think with the new, there's like a forty three MPT that is like a seventy five mile an hour rating. But you know these tires have to carry. You, you know you can't have a dual rear tire on yeah. an off road vehicle because rocks, sticks, debris get stuck in the middle. It becomes an issue. It does very quickly. So you're currently right now, you know, in the same way that like the limiting factor of a lot of uh, travel trailers and toy haulers was what the vehicles could tow. You know, they've gotten bigger as the tow vehicles are sure. higher performing. You know, the the vehicles right now, if smart, have to be built to the capability of those tires. It's limited by um, them. And know, the MPTs are really good off road. They handle. Yeah. They don't chunk. They don't. They rarely have flats. They're very, very durable. They're heavy duty military you tires. Keep them within their range, That's though. Right. Their their range of design, because particularly like the new again, keep going back to Earth Roamers, but the new LTIs, they're a little lighter, right? Because they're carbon fiber composite camper, but they have more horsepower and they have a ten speed transmission, so they can just chug up stuff and go as fast as you really want. Doesn't mean that you actually can. You, That's right. You, you, again, you have to, you know, you're driving a medium duty or, you know, or a heavy duty commercial truck, no matter what you're doing in any expedition vehicle, you are not building an expedition vehicle on an F-150. Like there's that one company that has, God, what are they? Something North that's building like these, technically they're an exhibition vehicle, but they're putting them on an F-150. Yeah. And they have like boat speakers on the back. Yeah. The tires aren't there. You know, the, the, the chassis is not there. You're not building them on an, on an LT truck. You're building them on a medium duty or heavy duty. That's right. And you have to adjust your mindset. Yeah. And to go off road in technical terrain, particularly if you get into mud, you've got to have these MPTs, but then you ha- you're you capped on the speed. If anybody listening that owns an earth roamer, check your speed right now when you're going down the road. Yeah. It's just 68 miles an hour. Travel slower. That's it. You just yeah. need to slow down, go with the same speed as the trucks, just mm-hmm. cruise along, get into a, a slower speed. And just remember, if anything goes wrong, if you have a blowout, or a cow runs into the road or it's always going to be better when you're going slower. You're going to be way better off having started off going slower. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these vehicles have pretty impressive braking they systems. Do. Once you're out of clamping pressure and those tires lock up, yep. your tire doesn't, at the end of the day, it's the tire that transfers the braking force to the ground. That's right. Once that tire locks up, even with ABS, there's still 20,000 pounds to stop. You know, in a lot of ways, it's driving like you're towing something really heavy. You have to watch the temperatures. And then making sure that you put as much weight forward as you can. We'll all look at some of these vehicles and the back seat area will be completely empty. And then the back of the vehicle is overloaded with all the really heavy stuff. I mean, it's shocking how many back seats are empty without a Greyhound. (laughs) But you got to move the weight forward because 
the rear tire is almost and always the one the that difference. blows out. You know, they're a large vehicle, uh, so small changes are hard to notice. But yep. by taking that rear case off, and and that accomplished two things. One, it was the weight of the case that I removed, and then two, I moved things forward. Probably removed things all together. I removed things all together, but I also moved, I shifted that weight forward closer to the axle. So you've got less of that pendulum effect mm-hmm. on the back end. It's much better off road. It's easier. You do notice 500 pounds, right? And your overall length is less. Yeah. Let's talk about actually the campers for a second. Okay. You've kind of got to be aware that things are going to break inside of these campers. Like I carry extra latches. Um, you know, if you've got a bunch of pots and pans and something, you know, some of these campers will have like little magnetic latches that reinforce things. You need to carry latches. I carry a small thing of wood screws because, you know, when I first got it and we were maybe using it more off-road than most, although actually Kevin, who owned mine, did use it off-road quite a bit, latches would break. I have kind of like a small, I'm going to call it like coach kit that stays in the camper and it fixes things that are going to be problems inside you know so you do have to consider that like i keep my truck stuff outside i keep my small little camper kit inside being careful about how much weight you put on the fridge door that's a thing that a lot of people don't think about don't overload this spice cabinet with wine bottles it's meant for spices lightweight um, or else those things fail the other thing i notice is that people will leave their water pumps on while they're traveling on dirt roads which results in cavitation of the pump oftentimes because of the vibration. So shut those things, shut those things off when you're going down the road, make sure, give it a walk around outside and in, because it's shocking the number of times that people will pull away and the, and the black water drain hose is still connected or, or the charging or or the charging hose, or they set their coffee cup on the back bumper or whatever, because they were in camp, give the vehicle a complete walk around on the outside. And then on inside, pull on every cabinet, make sure everything's closed and latched. Developing that kind of pre-drive checklist. You got to do it every time. I don't have a a notepad where I'm I'm making stuff. I don't think you need to just walk around and look. On that kind of preparation. And it's always, you know, your vehicle is going to tell you things on commercial trucks. Wheel bearings are more of a thing. So hub temperature. So when I, I, I start my checks when I get out of the vehicle, like every time I get fuel or I stop, I put my tire, my hand on the tire and I put my hand near the hub yep. because if that wheel bearing is going, it's going to be creating a lot of heat. You check, you check things like that before we leave for, you know, whether we just had lunch or whatever, I go and I verify every latch is closed because yep. if you're going to, you know, it sounds so trivial, but if you are, you stop for lunch and you're on an extended off-road trail or whatever, and you break a latch and you don't have a replacement, like you either, the, the solution is that you then take the drawer out, put it on your bed or something. Yeah. Because otherwise it's just going to sit there. That's how they really break as people forget to latch them. Or- and they slam closed. I was on one trip and their overhead cabinet wasn't latched. And I can't remember what it was. Some kind of a pot or pan came out and it landed squarely on the induction cooktop. It and then destroyed you glass everywhere. It had gla- there was glass everywhere inside and it destroyed the induction cooktop. So they and had no way, way to cook, no way to cook. If you just take an extra couple minutes to give it a very, now we should be doing that with every vehicle. Yeah. And you know, I have a daily and a weekly check sheet that I do on every trip, but it's even more important with these campers because you're literally going down the road with your house on yeah. the back. And I mean, some of these things actually have a washing machine, which I thought was ridiculous. <laughs> and you know, until you live some, on the road, yeah. until you live on the road and you're like, Oh man, I just spent like two hours trying to find a a, a place to do laundry and cooking is a big thing too. You're no longer in the realm of little butane stoves. You can bring more, which means you can prepare more extravagant or healthy meals or healthy meals. Like it sounds silly. We almost exclusively cook in our instant pot now. Uh, It's a one pot. It's I do the dishes and then Laura cooks because she's she's a great cook, a wonderful cook. But that's one less thing for me to clean, which, you know, not every one of these vehicles has huge water storage or you may be trying to conserve water. Like when we take it down to Baja, we're a little bit less, you know, we generally try and run on the water that we have because we know it comes from our house. And the unfortunate reality of traveling in some places is that the water isn't always. Or it's hard to get to it's a hard to get water purified or, water yeah, station. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know, it's it's less to clean. It's it's all you know self contained. It uses actually very little energy. So once it heats up, it's just cooking on pressure. We're even thinking about bringing like a little air fryer because awesome. we we don't use the 
like that we have a diesel burner and we have like a microwave convection oven sure. thing we have like never used those things because these you know there's so many like one pot meals that you can do in an instant pot and then um, you can make french fries or whatever yeah in the you can do it air fryer you want. yeah like, make cookies in the air fryer we use it at home a lot yeah sure um, you know laura has even made kind of like a little cookbook for earth Roamer recipes and it simplifies trying to figure out what you're doing. I mean, I, I, I'm sure most people can relate to this, but you're going out camping, whether it's your buddies, your family or whatever, and you know how to grocery shop for home, Sure. but then you don't know how to grocery shop for camping. So having repeatability with the things that you're making or one of 20 to choose from, cool, this is what I need for my list. That has been huge for us. Yeah. It's, it's removed a a pain point of travel because you're going to grocery stores that you're not familiar with, whatever. Yeah. So oh, that's great advice on the interior layout. Just making it as open and spacious and simple as possible is a great idea. I would never want to have an expedition vehicle that didn't have a shower and a toilet. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, I, I see some that don't or one of my beefs with the, the well, at, at any pop top is that you, when you're, when you're traveling, assuming you're traveling with somebody for a while and you have to use the bathroom yeah. to do a number two, like you don't want to like be sitting under this half wall. Like yeah. that's, that's one of the reasons why I like a hard side. You want some camper. privacy. Yeah. I, if I have to go drop one, like <laughs> even if you're married to that person, like you don't want to be making eye contact <laughs> when you're doing it, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, that's a good point, though. I mean, it, and it's really it depends on the person. Yeah, some some couples, you know, maybe they ha hold hands while they do that. Who knows? But I, it, you just like for everybody, that. everybody has different needs, and it's being really honest about what you need. And if one of your goals is to get to remote technical places, you're going to end up with a. You should get a much smaller camper. Yeah, if you just really want an all wheel drive RV, then get something big because yeah. you might as well have the washing machine in there. You know, yeah. if you can afford it, I mean, really it's being, I think, honest about what you want. Cause unfortunately a lot of these expedition vehicles, decisions are made around how it reflects the ego as opposed yeah. to how it reflects the traveler's needs. Your ego is going to get a bump no matter what. So just let that part of it go because you're going to be driving something super cool, yeah. no matter what they're, version. They're all pretty cool. They're all super cool. So no matter what version you get, the problem is, is like spending $2 million on a camper. Like no one knows no one can re re even relate to that. It's yeah. really about buying what you need that really meets your needs. I, I you know, I don't want to like disparage the company or, or anything, but like a lot of the like GXV guys that do these very extravagant builds, they, they're at Overland Expo and then they're just off into the ether. Like you never hear of or see these people traveling yeah. because I think they're, they're obviously very expensive. So I, I always correlate the ability to afford something with probably being you know, fairly busy. And it's like, it's this project. Yeah. It's like they're building their boat, but then they realize I didn't really need the party deck on top of my camper. Yeah. That's the worst place to put weight on one of these vehicles. Yeah. Spend some time in one, you know, unfortunately it's really hard to rent these because I get people that ask me, will you rent your earth roamer for a week or whatever? I'm like, absolutely There's like not, not a like, number that works. If you just get somebody that doesn't know what they're doing and they're going up a hill and they just have the thing, you know, pegged going up a large grade, you could blow the motor on it. For sure. You know, they don't latch the latches because that's, you know, it's just new. I'm not saying it's negligence, but they just don't know. And then, oh, well, you know, you got to get a woodworker in or, or yeah. something. So it's, it's hard to know, but, but generally I think go with the smallest camper and the least amount of stuff that keeps you comfortable. Like being able to be inside of something that is, you know, kind of climate controlled, that is the luxury. You don't need the rare Grecian marble backsplash. Yeah, you really don't. Um, you don't need the whatever some of these extravagant things are. And really you know, consider you this. You get people that want bathtubs. I know. And I'm I like, know. it takes 100 gallons of water to do a bathtub. <laughs> like, buy a class A. Yeah, true. It's yeah. so true. It's so, And then being a campsite where you're plugged into the city water and you can have all the things you want. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of, of importance around if you have the resources getting the serialized unit because you're going to end up with a better experience, better serviceability, better reliability, but you're also going to gain back a bunch of time. A good friend of mine built a custom expedition camper. He was not resource constrained, but he decided he wanted to do it his way. And it took him almost two years to build the vehicle. And I asked him what it, of, of any regrets that he had. He said, my number one regret is that I didn't just buy an earth roamer and leave. Yeah. And so fill in their earth cruiser and leave, yeah. adrenaline camper and leave, buy something 
that is a serialized unit that has a high degree of reliability that's been well proven and then go. We only have so much time. Yeah. It was his number one regret is that he got exactly the vehicle that he wanted with all of the gadgets, all of the custom bumpers and suspension and all that other stuff. But he said, he said, I lost two years of experiences. And, and you can, you can try and, you know, optimize as much as you want, but the, the reality is that hotels exist. Yeah. Like if you, you know, rather than getting something that's like massive, massive, like I don't think they're making that earth Roamer HD anymore. I think it was just too big. It's too it's big. Just too much stuff. It's just too, you big. know, like if you need, if you need the washer and dryer or this or this, you have the coin to drop million, two million dollars on something. Presumably then you have the coin to just stay at a nice hotel and say, dry clean this or, or yep. whatever. Like I, I know that's not like the ethos of traveling and what we like to promote, but there's nothing wrong with you that can either. Still stay in if if you're after yeah. absolute comfort. At least once a week, we stay in a hotel when we're doing extended travels because living in a small box with another person is still like living in a small box with another person. <laughs> like I want to go have a drink at the hotel, despite bar what the backsplash is made out of. Yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. Be realistic. You know, try and get something that's as small. The earth roamers that I always look at with envy are the they have like the suicide door on the yeah. back. They're the extended cab. The extended cab that are the LTs. Yes. I always look at those with a lot of envy. But then I'm like, okay, like that would be great for like more off road. Like I would love to drive one of those to South America. They don't make them anymore. In reality, I need the the full back seat for the dog. Sure. And there's three of us in this space that from the outside looks really big, but on the inside isn't actually that huge. And it was worth it. To have the two feet, so I'm really happy with that. Could I? You are happy, and you like look at how long you've kept the vehicle. I, I it's have, literally met all of your needs, yeah. and I think that that's the key. Is you bought? There's a reason why they sell so many Earth Roamers is yeah. because they are kind of dialed. Yeah, it's the same reason why they sell so many Earth Cruisers. They're Somebody dialed. I lived in one. I lived work. in one for weeks and weeks and weeks, and I loved it. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. They're really good, and you know there are. You know, these things are very expensive. There's just yeah. no way of, of, of beating around the bush with that. But everything's you know, expensive. Everything, yeah. everything has become expensive. Yeah. But, you know, there are options that are out there now that are uh, comparable in size yep. and functionality that are becoming more affordable. Again, somebody's like, oh, well, that's still more than my house. Like, yeah, it's an expensive space. Like, that's why the core of it is and, and the soul of it to me is still like the DIY guys yep. that are building their own campers. And there's a lot of them out there. And there's a lot. But, you know, uh, Adrenaline has come out with something that's really attractive. The Adventure Trucks yep. XT, yep. which is kind of a sub of, of GXV. They were acquired by uh, the group behind Storyteller. There are options and in this space these days. And I think it's going to be really cool to see where it goes. Because I see so much interest in it. I really see this kind of... There's like this progression of, you know, they start with the ground tent, they go to the roof tent, they go to the hard shell tent, yep. maybe a truck camper or a wedge camper. And then it's van, uh, you know, as people's families grow, as sure. you get older and you want a little bit more comfort. It, it seems like this is a segment of the industry that will continue to grow. And as it does, it will become more competitive and there should be more, more options available for different price ranges. And once we start seeing vehicles like this at RV dealers um, and even... Earth Roamer and Earth Cruiser now, you can finance them. Finance is a 20-year RV loan. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, some of them you can finance as equipment to kind of keep your cash, you know, making money. We could still sell ours for more than we paid for it. That's not always going to be the case. But with some of these vehicles, when you start, you're in these financial circles, they don't want to wait the year. So you can use yours. And if it's in, you know, kind of like new condition, maybe you put 10, 15,000 miles onto it probably selling it for what you bought it for. Yeah. That's where we're at currently. It's not financial advice, but there's been a lot of people I know that have gotten a new earth roamer every year or two. And we know a lot of the yeah. guys it just keeps waterfalling, cascading That's over. Right. Expedition vehicles are a comfortable way to travel. If you want to be on the road for a long period yeah. of time, it's kind of nice to have your space. Yep. Despite the weather, it could be minus 20 out or whatever. There's reasons why they're popular and they are popular globally. Uh, they're probably the most popular in Germany and, yeah, and Germany in that part. Yeah, Germany such a Europe, huge scene. Germany, Switzerland, really Austria. Yeah, very, very popular there. So it'll be interesting to see where this goes. Yep. I geek out on this stuff. So if anybody has any questions, reach out to me on Instagram. It's just Matt Explore. Yep. All right. So there, there are some really great books out there. This one, those that are on 
the YouTubes that you can see it. This one is written by Ulrich Dolde, and this is not in English, but you can buy an electronic version that it is in English. It was okay. translated. It's called Von Mobile. Von Mobile. And it is kind of the Bible of expedition vehicles. I didn't even know about this one. Yeah. So that one's that one's kind of insane. And then there's actually like like we all grew up with Haynes manuals. Believe it or not, there is actually an Overland camper. It's, it's it's really big in Europe. There's a Haynes manual, Overland camper by uh, Mr. Wigglesworth. Oh my Literally God. Steve name, Steve Wigglesworth. I don't an, know Steve. Steve. Awesome you name. You have an amazing last name. You have name. an innate, amazing last name. This one here when it comes to driving expedition vehicles off-road. This book here is incredibly valuable. Uh, it has English and German captions, but it talks a lot about technique in driving these really large expedition vehicles and campers off-road. Uh, so this one's really important because there is some adjustments to how they need to be driven. Yeah. I didn't even know about this. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so Unimog Geländefahrschule, Unimog Off-Road Driving School, Yeah, uh, Gisbert Hindenacht. For the DIY, you really want to try to find the Ulrich Dolde book. Uh, I believe um, that Michael Braley is going to be your contact on that out of Germany. If you go to, I think they're Overland Europe. Wow, this really dives in. Yeah, so that, one is, that one's really, really nuanced. And it's also very current. These books, oftentimes around building campers, have an expiration date because the systems change so often. But this book is only maybe a year old, so wow. it's, it's yeah, this very is really cool. It's very current and extremely detailed, and you can get an English version uh, that's been translated. So very cool. A lot of resources out there. Of course, there's a lot of conversations on Expedition Portal forum around Expedition Camper DIY builds. There's yeah, a huge that's community. Where I've gotten most of my information. There's from. a lot of community activity still around that. There's some good Facebook groups too. Matt has offered to answer all of your questions via Instagram DM. So yeah, as many as I can. <laughs> and there's also a lot of people, you know, that I follow that are in the process of building their trucks. True. That you can follow on Instagram so you yep. can see what they're doing, how they're doing it. And maybe that's your first step is it's just some that's right. For that's right. Consider an expedition vehicle. And if you build your own, we would love to see a picture of it. Yeah. We can post it up at a future date. Um, and we thank you all for listening. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye.